Good afternoon. I'm Pat Living with the Department of Health and Social Services and moderator for the COVID-19 update for Friday, May 29th. Today we are joined by Yukon Premier Sandy Silver and the Yukon's Chief Medical Officer of Health, Dr. Brendan Hanley. At the end of their presentation, we will go to the phone lines for questions from reporters. We will call you by name and you will each have one question plus one follow-up. Our French-speaking journalists are encouraged to ask their questions in French. With us today is André Boursier from the French Language Services Directorate to translate those questions for those who do not speak French. Following this presentation, we will go to the virtual town hall. Thank you. Premier Silver? Thank you very much, Pat. Uh, and thank you, everybody, for joining us here on the traditional territory of the Kwanlandan and the Ta'an Kwachin Council. Uh, as Pat mentioned, uh, this afternoon it's going to look a little bit different. Uh, we will begin with a media briefing uh, and uh, proceed to the town hall with questions from the public after that. I will speak very briefly so that we can get into the questions quickly. Uh, Yukon is firmly in phase one of our path forward plan. This week saw the reopening of personal services, uh, businesses, and today restaurants can offer dine-in services again. As of June 4th, all Yukon territorial parks and campgrounds will be opened and Yukoners can get out and enjoy these rec recreational facilities. Campers, be respectful as you travel through communities and follow the guidance uh, issued by the communities, please. Uh, we uh, have released our new guidelines for responsible travel within Yukon, uh, which were developed with input from communities and can be found on yukon.ca. If you're going camping, prepare yourself with all of your supplies and food that you need for your stay. Take extra precautions to clean and to sanitize surfaces, to wash your hands, limit your gatherings to uh, your family bubble or groups of 10 or less, and please stay two meters apart. In our current phase, travel to communities is no longer limited to essential purposes. What that means is that you can travel throughout Yukon, but please do so responsibly following the guidelines released today. Each community is taking steps to ensure that they feel safe and prepared for visit visitors, and we ask Yukoners to stay informed and be respectful of the community's wishes. If you are traveling within Yukon, you, we will still like you to uh, like we will still like to ask you to ensure that you have adequate supplies and are prepared to travel uh, through a community efficiently as you will see in the guidelines just published you may shop in local stores and buy food in restaurants as you travel uh, if they are open for your business but please do not linger unnecessarily outside shops or in the communities if you do not have a specific purpose for being there most of all, continuing, continue to practice the six steps for staying safe. The changes that we see, uh, have, have seen recently are important steps on our path forward plan. We are monitoring the impacts of these changes specifically to see if there's a resurgence of COVID-19 cases. If all goes well, and if there is no change in Yukon's infection numbers, we feel that by June 15th, we will be able to begin moving towards phase two. We are on track to begin phase two of our reopening plan by July 1st. This timeline is fully endorsed by the Chief Medical Officer of Health. We are confident in our healthcare capacity, in our ability to test, and our ability to track and contain this virus. It is that confidence and all the skills that we have gained in the past two months that allows us to begin to move to phase two of this plan. Yukon's Chief Medical Officer of Health is confident that, we, that when we do uh, transition to the next phase, we will also be able to lift restrictions on travel to and from British Columbia which would allow for the free movement of Yukon and BC residents back and forth with no recommendation, with no requirement for self-isolation. We are working towards being able to lift these restrictions between BC and Yukon by July 1st. We continue to monitor other jurisdictions to determine if it is safe to lift travel restrictions, and we will share that information if and when it becomes available. Now, lifting restrictions, travel restrictions to British Columbia is possible because of the epidemiology of COVID-19 in that province and in our territory. It is not only a question of geography. 
It is based on science, careful risk assessment, and our confidence in how British Columbia is managing this pandemic. That confidence comes from our long-standing and close working relationship, particularly in the public health field. I will ask Dr. Hanley later to speak more on his part on that. Phase two will also see a number of other challenges, uh, sorry, another, uh, uh, a list of other changes uh, for uh, allowing uh, for outdoor social gatherings of up to 50 people and expanded dine-in capacities for restaurants based upon public health assessments. As we continue to monitor the progress of the uh, virus nationally, we will consider exceptions for essential workers traveling from regions where the virus is contained and spread is minimal. Now, prior to lifting these travel restrictions, we will continue to work with communities, municipalities, First Nations governments to make sure that they are comfortable with visitors in their communities and that they feel safe. This is an important part of moving ahead with these changes. Our announcement today fits with our gradual and phased approach to reopening that focuses on protecting our communities our most vulnerable residents, and on minimizing the risk of exposing Yukoners to a local wave of this virus. As always, we will continue to provide updates as we move forward. We know that recovery and a return to normalcy is on everyone's minds right now. So too is Yukon's desire for their communities to remain safe. We must remain diligent in the fight against this virus. This diligence falls to each and every one of us as Yukoners. We saw this week how dangerous it, is, dangerous it is if people do not follow recommendations. In, British, uh, in New Brunswick, the actions of one individual who traveled and then returned to work without following the recommendations has now caused a return to more severe restrictions in his community. We do not want to see that here. We must balance the fact that we can't be too strict for too long for the sake of our mental health and our societal and economical well-being. So long as we continue to practice these six steps to staying, to staying safe, we can con confidently prog progress through the next phase of this plan. As we begin relaxing health measures and, uh, and reopening society, it remains a very real possibility that strict measures will be needed to be reinstated. We should all be very conscious of this reality. We need to remember that this is not a sprint, it is a marathon. And we need to remain diligent in taking personal responsibility for staying safe and practicing the safe six. While we are working towards how uh, our territory adopts to living uh, with COVID-19, COVID-19 is not going away completely anytime soon. We must adapt to a world where we can live safely with this virus. We thank everyone for their cooperation and for making so many sacrifices. Because of the hard work that you have done, we are able to be in this absolutely fortunate position that we see ourselves in today. Thank you very much, Dr. Hanley. Thank you, Premier. This is an exciting day for all of us. As the Premier mentioned, we are on track to begin phase two of the reopening plan by July 1st. And I am confident that if we continue on this current path, we will be in a good place to move our territorial plan forward. We've received a lot of support from many individuals to allow us to start moving our territory slowly, deliberately, gradually forward. During our response to COVID-19 over the last couple of months, I have been thinking and saying often um, about the unintended and additional effects that this disease and our response has had on people's health and well-being by affecting people's workplaces, businesses, incomes, social networks, education, and many of the other societal supports for healthy living. Some changes brought on by COVID-19 Restrictions have brought benefits, such as increased, ben increased innovation, and for some, increased family and community connectedness. But we know 
that there have been adverse effects on individuals and communities. We've heard from frontline providers there's been an increase in harms related to alcohol and other substance use. I'm concerned about those who are homeless and vulnerably housed, children living and families at risk, families with domestic violence. And I'm worried about patients when medical care is delayed, either by themselves or the healthcare system, and the ways that this can affect their health. I'm concerned about those who have lost secure income due to changes in the way we are living. In fact, many people and businesses, especially those who depend on outside visitors, are close to financial ruin or desperation. And we sense increasing public unrest at keeping distant from each other. There's also a toll of domestic violence for some who are shut in against their will. And there are families who are kept apart even in these times of need. We have started gathering data to, data to more formally report on these unintended consequences of being shuttered down. Other jurisdictions have begun to document changes in people's health and wellness due to COVID-19, including increased alcohol consumption related to stress and boredom, decreasing immunization rates, worsening of chronic health conditions due to unmet health needs. Locally, although we've noted a drop in overall visits to the emergency department since early March, at the same time we've seen more visits for overdoses and mental health, uh, uh, mental health concerns. And it was only a short number of weeks ago that we had to announce seven drug-related deaths since January 2020, including four deaths in March and April related to fentanyl. EMS have noted similar increases in, in calls for alcohol intoxication and overdoses and mental health reasons. The RCMP have noted an increase in assaults, domestic violence, possession and trafficking calls, and increases in calls related to the Mental Health Act. In summary, I'm increasingly concerned about the overall health and wellness of our territory. So as we go forward, I am looking for opportunities to alleviate some of this building pressure. So this is the time to look at our plan for easing border restrictions as part of phase two and beyond. Phase two has had that language about creating exceptions to our border closures, so we have done some thinking and listening in that regard. As I've stated to media before, and to you, the public, my advice to government has always been that we need to be prepared to open borders gradually when we are confident that the risk of importation of COVID is low. As you know, BC has demonstrated successful flattening of the curve due to their strong public health response. As we look to exceptions in border restrictions, it makes sense to intentionally partner with British Columbia by opening our Yukon borders to more travel between BC and Yukon. This will allow Yukoners to travel to BC and return without having to self-isolate and allow BC residents to travel into Yukon, whether for business or for pleasure, without the need to self-isolate. A border check-in process will still occur to ensure that the BC folks have not been out of their province in the previous two weeks and otherwise are informed at the border of all the important measures we have in place, including the safe six measures to observe. Choosing BC as fitting, given our existing partnership with BC in so many areas, not the least of which is our ongoing public health partnership. For many years, we've had a close relationship with BC's healthcare system, and in particular, my office has a strong partnership with BC Public Health and their many teams, including their special laboratory at BC CDC, their epidemiology unit, many of their public health policy units, and my own collegial relationship with Dr. Bonnie, Bonnie Henry as my counterpart in BC. But let's not kid ourselves. Just like any of our opening measures, any relaxing of the borders will involve taking more risk with COVID. On the other hand, we know that we can handle COVID as long as we are observing public health measures, most notably the safe six measures and protecting those who are most vulnerable. None of us wants to get behind with community spread. And if we all do our jobs correctly, we can prevent that from happening. We still could get cases or clusters or outbreaks anytime, 
but I feel that we're in a very good place to be able to handle cases of COVID since should they arrive, and that includes cases in communities or in Whitehorse. Getting through this pandemic means taking calculated, smart, and perhaps bold risks. If we carefully relax our borders, we will open up a way to provide relief to people suffering under the current measures, whether that means more customers, access to goods, a safer drug supply, or a chance to connect with friends and family. Our cost will be a higher risk of COVID coming in. This is not an easy decision to make, but it's the right decision to make for the sake of all of us. It means we will continue to test for and look for the disease. We'll need to keep closely observing COVID activity in the rest of the country so we can keep track of the risk of importing cases. We will continue to work very closely with our partners in, with our partners in BC to stay on top of the epidemiology. It will mean the public has to work with us to keep observing the safe six practices. It means we will be as transparent as we can be about sharing information. It means that if the risk of cases in BC gets worse again, or if we get more cases than we can handle, that we have to go back to more restrictions. That could even involve closing borders again. We will be working on details of how we promote and monitor this change. For example, we intend to ensure that people coming from BC have, will not have been in contact with known cases and will, will not have been out of the province in the previous two weeks. We may also require people arriving within the previous two weeks not to visit more vulnerable individuals or long-term care sites. As another example of border exceptions, over the next four weeks, we will be working directly with industries such as the mining industry to allow them to select low-risk mining workers to be able to self-isolate on site at the mines under strict supervision and protocols. These are the areas that we'll be focusing on as we prepare for phase two over the next four weeks. Part of this gradual approach involves a philosophy of gradually moving away from enforcement to persuasion and education. Enforcement increases stress and stress increases so many other areas of well-being. Whether we're applying good public health principles or sound governance, we should always be obliged to use a proportionate approach. And that's one of the principles of our go forward uh, plan for Yukon. And we need to use the least onerous methods to achieve our goals. It's only an hour ago that we talked about the uh, the border uh, opening plans to and the BC connection with Yukon's chiefs, and only two days ago that the Premier and I talked about this particular approach of partnering with BC and the timing for phase two. Th things are happening quickly. Many of the chiefs expressed concerns for very understandable reasons, and my advice to them was that there is no easy way forward. Any choice we make at this point carries risks. But the lesser overall risk to people's health is in the approach I'm advising for phase two. What I did again commit to was for me and my team and for the Yukon government to work with the chiefs and communities over the next four weeks to make this plan as safe and as trustworthy and as effective as we can. So I hope that we can all work together on these next phases so we can ensure that everyone has the supports they need and the information they need to observe the measures uh, that uh, we need to take. Particularly, as Premier said, in observing the safe six. As the public, you have a major role to play in this. It's up to all Yukoners to help to make this idea work, to improve our well-being overall, while protecting us from what we know COVID can bring. From this point onward, the safe rules of conduct will be increasingly important until we can be assured of protection from vaccine. That's all for my update. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Hanley. Thank you, Premier Silver. Uh, I will call on the reporters. We appear to be having some trouble with the phone line, so I will call your name and... Uh, 
if uh, you can't hear me or can't uh, we can't make yourself heard, we are working on another way for you to get through. Uh, we'll start with Gord from the Yukon News. Is the line completely down? Sorry about that, folks. The line is completely down. Okay, so in in light of that, what we'll do is we will move to the virtual town hall, uh, and when we get the phone lines back up or a way to um, to ensure that the reporters can ask their questions, we'll go back there. Um, so we had put out a call last week for the general public to submit questions that uh, Premier Silver and Dr. Hanley would answer. We had more than 130 questions submitted. We've been able to theme those into uh, about 10 different areas. Obviously, we can't answer all 130 today. So we have chosen one representative question from each of the themes. And the other questions, we, uh, we have committed to uh, finding answers for them and posting the answers online, probably not till next week, but we will do a sort of a virtual town hall Q&A. So you can, if you don't hear your question asked today, check for it online next week. Um, I'm joined this afternoon by Matthew Cameron from the uh, Cabinet Office, who is going to uh, share the questions with me so that I don't have to talk <laughs> for much, for very long. And Matthew's actually going to start us off. Matthew? You don't have to do that. Thank you, Pat. Uh, our first question centers around child care. The question uh, goes as follows. Yukon government's COVID-19 response included providing childcare at no cost to Yukon's essential workers, which is quite a lengthy list of occupations. Has this brought up the discussion within YG about the importance of affordable childcare in our post-COVID world? What does YG intend to do to help fund childcare now that YG has demonstrated the high importance they place on our childcare facilities and workers? That, that's the thrust of the question, but there were also some related ones about how many children can be at child care facilities now and how vulnerable children are to COVID-19, as well as how cohorts are working uh, for small groups of children in these facilities. Uh, Thanks very much, Matt. Uh, we, we know that uh, child care is an incredibly important part of, of all of our communities. Uh, early childhood educators uh, and, and child care uh, uh, operators, they're extremely essential uh, to ensuring that Yukoners can, can go to work uh, every day and that our children are taken care of, they are nurtured, uh, educated uh, at, at, at the critical stages in their lives. Uh, in early April, our government announced that we would be covering staff wages uh, as well as eligible business expenses, uh, including rent, uh, utilities, and cleaning costs uh, for child care centers and also for family day, uh, day homes. This was to help uh, the care operators to adapt to the new realities uh, that we are facing here under, uh, under the COVID-19 days. Um, our government was also proud to, uh, to increase funding to uh, child care operators for the uh, first time in a decade in 2018. Uh, this increase in funding included uh, additional support for rural child care programs and is part of our work to make sure that children have access to affordable uh, early learning and, and also child care. Uh, our government is committed to, uh, to supporting child care operators because we recognize that they are vital uh, to keeping our community strong and, and, and resilient. Now going forward, we will absolutely be looking at what kind of child care supports uh, 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 that we can have for the operators across the territory, uh, making sure that we, uh, we, we keep an eye on providing them that quality care and, and that they can provide the quality care for the, for the kids uh, and early learning opportunities, not only now, but also into those future generations for, for, uh, for future Yukoners as well. Dr. Hanley? If you could address the cohort issue, please. <laughs> sure. Um, so, well, probably a few things I could say, but um, what um, the, the way that uh, child care is working in, in the COVID climate, climate is around uh, cohorting of small children, recognizing that uh, th that small children cannot be cannot safe uh, space in the in the traditional way that we think of it as being two meters apart. So, the solution around that is to 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 uh, to limit to children to smaller groups with one daycare uh, attendant at a time. So in that way, you're 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 keeping groups of kids uh, ap apart from each other. Um, and uh, 
the uh, the other part was about uh, susceptibility of kids to COVID-19. As we know, uh, children do um, get COVID-19. I think uh, Quebec reported 44 cases amongst school children so far uh, since return to school, which is actually uh, quite a low number con con considering the uh, number of kids that were going to school. So it does show that kids, uh, kids do get COVID less frequently than adults and less severely than adults and also they don't appear to be as effective at transmitting uh, disease as um, as adults and um, adolescents thank you so the next question is i have heard that there's an active case of covid19 in the town of atlin I was wondering, being that Atlin receives most, if not all, of their official services from the, the critical services from Yukon, are they being counted in our current numbers? And does this now confirm that we have community spread if the individual affected did not travel? I know Dr. Hanley does not release names of communities or individuals, but if there is a confirmed case down there, and being that it was stated that Northern BC communities are being treated as part of the Yukon, what is in place for medical aid for those communities should they have a large scale outbreak? There are many interesting questions that wrapped up into that one question. <clears throat> First is that um, I'm not apprised of a case in Atlin. Normally, we um, would be apprised of, of a case in Atlin through the northern uh, northern region of BC Public Health, and uh, so um, I'm I'm not aware of a of a case um, in in Atlin. Now. Um, if there were a case, how would that play out? Might, might be the more important uh, question. And one thing to one thing in that question is: Does a case in a community mean that there is community spread? And of course, that those are two different different concepts. So, if there were, for example, a case in Atlin, then it would be a matter of whether that case can be traced back to an identifiable um, uh, cause, uh, identifiable uh, place. Um, so, for example, uh, someone who traveled into Atlin um, traveled uh, through Whitehorse, which is, of course, the way to get to Atlin, and uh, but, but came from another area, um, and uh, and and therefore was um, effectively an imported case. So that would that uh, if that case were then appropriately isolated, um, uh, and with a confirmed source, then that would not be an indication of community spread, and it would not change. Uh, it would be similar to uh, to the to the case that we had in one of our communities. Uh, where it, uh, the, the case was appropriately identified, contacts were identified and isolated, a source was confirmed, um, and therefore there was no indication of um, community spread or any increase in, in public risk. And that's been a pattern with all of our cases. So yeah, I guess to make a long story short, an, a case in Atlin would not necessarily change anything about um, uh, um, uh, about our, our, our particular bubble with, with Atlin or um, our, um, uh, our, our approach. Now this, B Atlin is administratively in the public health uh, region of BC, so the reporting would be through northern, the northern uh, BC um, public health reporting. It would not be reported as a Yukon case. Uh, it, it would be if that person needed medical, uh, at, uh, medical attention beyond the health center at Atlin, then Whitehorse would be the appropriate place, and that, so that health service would be afforded in, in um, Atlin. And uh, in in terms of uh, if there were an outbreak, um, if we were asked to assist with an outbreak, um, uh, we would of course uh, be cooperating with the Northern Public Health and organizing that um, outbreak response. Thank you, Dr. Hanley. The next question has to do with travel uh, into and through the Yukon. Uh, the question goes as follows. My biggest question is around the people we are allowing to travel through Yukon and minors who are coming in from outside the territory. The total trust in an honor system that they will not stop at grocery stores or anywhere else seems to not be working, judging by the number of U.S. and other out-of-territory plates being seen around town. 
We will never eliminate COVID locally if we are steadily letting in people and not really monitoring whether they're following uh, rules that are in place to keep the community safe. Is there a way that this can be better monitored with random spot checks on people's whereabouts? Has the government been monitoring this at all to ensure the honor system is working? And then related to this, there have also been questions about how long the 14-day self-isolation period for those entering the territory will remain in place. Uh, thanks, Matt. Uh, thanks for the question. Uh, it's a great question. Uh, we are educating travelers as they enter and asking them as well uh, um, as they pass through to do so within 24 hours on their way to their destination outside of Yukon. Uh, we have enforcement officers in uh, Carmax, uh, Mayo, Dawson City, Ross River, Faro, Haynes Junction, Old Crow, Teslin, and Watson Lake. Uh, and uh, the RCMP remain available to support uh, enforcement in, in all communities. Uh, those enforcement officers are, are informing travelers uh, about the requirements and uh, may issue fines. They, make, they, they can uh, issue arrests as well uh, if they are finding people that are violating the, uh, the SEMA orders, that's the, uh, the uh, Civil Emergency Measures Act orders. Uh, we have a call-in number as well uh, where Yukoners can report concerns and that number is available on yukon.ca. Uh, we also have set up roadside information stations outside of Whitehorse uh, to ensure travelers in transit through Yukon understand their mandated uh, route uh, through the territory and also the restrictions that are in place under SEMA, the Civil Emer Emergency Measures Act. We, we need to keep in mind that uh, the Alaska Highway is absolutely a, a, a major transportation link that is connecting the continental United States uh, to Alaska, and many people are on their way uh, to Alaska to work in, in critical and essential roles there. And I do appreciate that there have been a lot of vehicles uh, with uh, outside license plates um, in our territory, uh, but that's not necessarily a, a good indication of whether the individuals are following current uh, guidelines that are in place or not. Um, our efforts to provide information and education about the SEMA orders have been very successful uh, in achieving compliance uh, and also understanding, uh, ensuring that both Yukoners and and uh, and people entering the territory as well uh, follow the guidance of the uh, of the COVID uh, that COVID nineteen has made necessary. Uh, so we will continue to work with our community partners uh, to keep the territory sta safe and, and healthy. Now, in in terms of the fourteen day isolation, uh, as we mentioned uh, earlier in the update, uh, you know. We are looking f towards entering that phase two of a path forward on July 1st. And if things go well uh, through June, uh, this will include a mobility bubble, uh, if you will, with BC that will allow residents of uh, Yukon and British Columbia to travel back and forth uh, and uh, uh, without the requirement of self-isolation. Uh, self so again, this is based upon epidemiology and uh, and risk uh, assessment with respect to British Columbia. Uh, the considerations about increased mobility uh, will continue to be guided by epidemiology and also risk assessment uh, and also the recommendations from Dr. Hanley uh, and, and his team. Nothing to add? Okay. We'll move to the next question then. This question is on testing and tracing. A strategic regular testing program for those with the most exposure to COVID-19, such as border guards, health workers, and others whose jobs involve contact with large numbers of people, will be a cost-effective early warning system for arrival of the virus in Yukon. Given the success of such proactive testing and contact tracing in other places where numbers or infections are low, has such an approach been considered here, and what measures are being implemented? Supplementary question, uh, we also had some questions about uh, the future of vaccine for COVID-19. Well, uh, two different areas, um, but we'll try to cover it all. Our, uh, uh, we are continually, uh, continually looking at our testing uh, strategy and revising it as we did uh, a couple of weeks ago. Uh, so we are um, in a, a very good uh, position in terms of our testing capacity. 
what uh, what our focus is is on uh, risk of importation uh, because all of our cases have been related to importation um, and that was the uh, reason behind our expanded criteria that were uh, published um, a few weeks ago for importation um, and then some other areas of proactive uh, what you might call proactive testing so testing for respire testing for people who are presenting with respiratory illness acute onset respiratory illness uh, without other obvious cause um, even if they don't have a travel history as one of those uh, very low threshold um, approaches to testing as well as some of the surveillance testing that is uh, being carried out in uh, the vul vulnerable sectors like at the shelter um, and then a whole regime around how uh, how testing is done with a very low threshold for long-term care again one of our one of our sites where of course people are more vulnerable to COVID infection. Contact tracing is another area, so we have um, uh, when when required by cases, uh, that's where the contact tracing um, kicks in, which involves uh, which involves uh, a regime of, of testing specifically um, around that. Uh, so uh, this approach has been successful. It's appropriate for our population. Were we to entertain uh, other parts of a testing, like um, a kind of random healthcare worker testing um, or some of the positions identified, that brings up the uh, the limitations of testing. So testing asymptomatic uh, people, apart from very kind of prescribed circumstances, um, such as uh, test asymptomatic as part of um, contact tracing um, in certain cases or in outbreak um, in outbreak situations, uh, in in sort of general general public uh, has not been demonstrated to really add anything, and in a in a low prevalence area like ourselves. So we would have a high false positive rate if we were to carry out testing. Um, and it would it would just bring us down, uh, divert really our public health capacity uh, into not very useful areas. So at the moment, it's a testing strategy that works for us. Um, and it's, it's able to keep us ahead of the curve. Um, the question about vaccine, uh, there are probably questions about Perhaps, uh, yeah, I haven't seen seen the actual questions probably about vaccine availability. Of course, that remains uh, an international, um, uh, a hugely um, important and uh, rapid, uh, uh, quickly evolving, rapidly evolving uh, international pursuit of, uh, of a vaccine. There will likely be many candidates. Ultimately, uh, one or more will be chosen as best uh, candidates. An international and a national priority prioritization framework will be developed um, in months to come uh, give, based on estimated supply and we of course will be part of that um, part of that conversation and uh, just to add to that on the conversations that I've been having with uh, the federal government and my colleagues across the provinces as well uh, we we the conversation about testing is uh, becoming increasingly uh, more important uh, and also immunity uh, conversations we know that uh, there's an immunity task force uh, that was uh, initiated from the Prime Minister I believe in April 23rd or around there uh, and uh, you know so that's that conversation is continuing as well uh, in that conversation we talked a lot about prioritizing populations we talked about prioritizing northern populations and and populations of uh, of indigenous communities as well uh, so that conversation is uh, is definitely topical and uh, I know the Prime Minister does um, uh, press releases after those conversations so that information is available online um, as dr. Hanley said the, the conversation when it comes to to uh, testing and tracing, it's obviously a very critical issue in uh, in places like Ontario and Quebec, uh, where there still are high cases, high numbers. Uh, we're very fortunate here in the Yukon um, because our cases have been kept low, uh, and we continue to take those precautions to ensure that we uh, can manage any cases th that may may incur occur uh, in the upcoming weeks and months. I, I think on this conversation as well, uh, it, it, as we look forward to uh, immunizations, as we look forward to conversations about vaccines, we we really want to make sure that at this point, as we have that conversation, that what's really important now is that people are following the safe six, um, including monitoring of their own symptoms as well. That That's what we can do now. Uh, we we also have uh, self-assessment tools that are available on uh, online if, if individuals in Yukon want to, uh, if they have any concerns about their symptoms, and, and also 
uh, for more information or, or contact, there, there's there's uh, 811 to call as well. Uh, but uh, really important right now as we look towards a future and look towards the science coming up to some solutions that, uh, that we remain safe uh, here and now. Thank you. Uh, the next question has to do with uh, substance use. And it goes, the intensive uh, live-in treatment program from substance use services for March, April, and May have been canceled. As of now, clients who have been on a long waiting list do not know when and how the program will be offered. As well, all other programming has been canceled. Meanwhile, the detox center remains open. What is the Department of Health and Social Services planning with respect to live-in treatment for clients that have been waiting, and when will it be running and offering services? The second part has to do specifically with drug abuse. Fentanyl still takes lives and affects many of our kids and citizens, whether fatal or not. With borders being closed and staffed with enforcement, how can we still see the level of illicit drug coming in from other provinces? What is being done between the Department of Justice and the RCMP to control the arrival of such substances in our territory during this pandemic? What is being done by the various departments to address the issues of fentanyl and illicit drugs? And then related to these, there's also questions about uh, mental health services being available in the territory. Uh, about it's service fentanyl or what it was. Oh, it, you want me to take that sure. first? Sure. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so I'll address the the, the drug uh, question first. I, again, a lot a lot of that is around um, enforcement, um, and uh, I I would say um, not really speaking directly for enforcement. One one answer though is. The enforcement, of course, that, that's presently on, uh, at place on the borders is enforcement that's aimed at uh, um, uh, travelers coming in and where they're coming from, and, and, and so it's really targeted enforcement around uh, the, uh, the SEMA orders um, and not specifically for uh, drug supply, uh, dr you know, possession of drugs, which would be, you know, different people, different skills, um, and different requirements. Um, n now... What I do know, though, and as I maybe hinted in my uh, my opening remarks, was that we know that that uh, the usual drug supply that, however, it makes it makes itself in, um, is likely being affected by present border restrictions. Almost almost like the reverse question, um, and and we know that there has been disruption in um, perhaps preferred pathways of drug supply, which has meant uh, um, or, or which has likely resulted resulted in some abnormal patterns of drug use and dangerous uh, or even more dangerous patterns of drug use in the, in the territory. Um, people um, um, do, doing more manufacturing locally, um, having supplies from sources that are less familiar, uh, taking drug combinations that are uh, not um, known to them. Um, I've heard of use of more meth, uh, methamphetamine, um, and uh, as I said, uh, we have seen more um, more overdoses. Whether that's related to this or not, we don't know for sure, but definitely disruptions in, in drug supply. So, I, I mean, the question is, a, is a, is a good one, but it, re it it really relates to how do we do federal policy around uh, around drugs and criminalization of drugs? Um, how are we um, looking at um, safer drug supply in general? How are we ensuring access to uh, to treatment and to um, substitution um, opioid opioid agonist therapy for people mm -hmm. who need it? Um, are they are they um, um, getting the, uh, the the information to be able to access the resources that are presently presently available. So it's a really multifold um, uh, answer. But as I noted, I am concerned about the the number of overdoses and and uh, the number of fentanyl related overdoses that continues to plague us. We've seen this in the rest of co the country. We've seen this in, in even in BC recently has reported another spike in opioid overdoses. Um, so this is this is um, a national. Uh, problem, and as uh, neighbors to uh, to BC, I think it's something that we also experience disproportionately. I can speak to the uh, the supports available in this question. Uh, this is an extremely important issue, uh, and I understand that Health and Social Services is working towards resuming the uh, the live-in intensive treatment program uh, end of June, uh, beginning of July. Um, and uh, there are new infection control measures that uh, that need to be put in place to manage the risk, and uh, and that work is is happening now. 
uh, substance use is is a serious issue, and it didn't go away because of COVID. Um, and and if if anything, it's compounded uh, the ongoing public health crisis uh, related to uh, high risks, uh, high rates uh, of illicit drug use, uh, and, and deaths, and and acute harms uh, from from substance use. Uh, so it's it's an extremely uh, important issue to for the government to stay on. Um, opioid treatment services uh, are available through the referred uh, care clinic. Uh, no referral is is required. Uh, there is also an opioid uh, overdose prevention coordinator available to provide naloxone uh, training and also naloxone kits uh, for individuals uh, as well as harm reduction education uh, for and supplies. Uh, in the community hubs, uh, which are extremely important uh, in this uh, in this fight, uh, staff, amazing staff, have uh, have provided harm uh, reduction uh, education and supplies. Uh, we have outreach nurses that are working uh, with marginalized populations uh, where needed on a daily basis. Thank you to them for their ongoing uh, uh, work. Uh, blood ties for directions uh, offer harm reduction services uh, as well, including fentanyl uh, testing in Whitehorse. Uh, that is. Monday through Friday uh, from 8.30 in the morning until 5.30 at night. And I know that Dr. Hanley and his team offer uh, harm uh, reduction services as well, including fentanyl testing in Whitehorse, uh, again at the same times, uh, Monday through Friday, 8.30 in the morning till 5.30 p.m. Um, or actually, I think that's just through the emergency shelter as well and the referral clinics. Uh, they're also beginning to refer, uh, to begin those fentanyl testings uh, at those locations. Uh, so... There are also continued mental health services available for Yukoners through the mental wellness hubs uh, and the substance use hubs that are in Dawson, in, uh, in Carmax, in, in Haynes Junction, and in Watson Lake. Uh, many services have been provided over the phone and online uh, in the past couple of months. Face-to-face uh, -face counseling is also still happening on a case-by-case -case basis. Uh, and I know that with uh, the spring weather uh, arriving here in the territory, there has been more of the uh, 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 more walk and talk sessions, I believe they're called, that, that are happening outside, uh, which is also very important. Um, but the mental health of, of, of many Yukoners has been impacted extremely uh, by this pandemic. And, and we need to ensure that we are looking out for one another, uh, checking in on one another, uh, and also taking time for ourselves as well. Right. Our next question. After over a month of no positive coronavirus cases, with no deaths and no hospitalizations, how long can you justify keeping the Yukon in a state of emergency? Subsequent question to this was, uh, while we are in COVID-19 times, how should people be handling elections that are coming up? So hmm. two different questions, <laughs> but... <laughs> okay, I can start. Uh, good questions, plural. plural. Uh, we, we're currently in a state of emergency uh, until June 26th, according to the, uh, the Act. Uh, we'll, we will evaluate uh, whether or not to extend this based upon discussions, obviously with uh, Chief, uh, uh, with Dr. Hanley and his, and his team uh, uh, and, and also others. Uh, and, and developments in other jurisdictions also. That's really important as to whether or not we, we continue those orders uh, here in the territory. The Civil Emergency Measures Act, it does give us the ability to be more responsive and to, and to act quickly in response to the ongoing situations that we do find ourselves in. Uh, it also gives the government the authority to enforce these orders, such as the uh, border restrictions, uh, the fines uh, for not following the orders, um, that kind of stuff. It is, uh, it's a key component of our response to the pandemic. There's no doubt about that. Um, now, all the actions that our government has taken under SEMA uh, are pr to protect the health and the safety of Yukoners uh, and, and support them through these challenging times. Uh, we continue to act based upon the recommendations of Dr. Hanley uh, and his team. Uh, they continue to evaluate the epidemiology and, and, and risk assessment of other jurisdictions, which is extremely important as we look at our controls uh, to make sure that we make those responsible uh, decisions for Yukoners. Uh, 
Well, I, I can just add quickly that um, um, in, in addition to what the Premier said about uh, the state of emergency, um, it, it really is, yeah, I, I agree it gives us those tools um, to be able to uh, to put in place all that we have put in put in place, also to be able to uh, to ease off gradually, as we've been talking about. Um, but it's not, again, the emergency is not based on what we have in, ter in territory. And, and reminded, we actually declared a public health emergency before we had any cases. So it really is around uh, what we anticipate and what are the risks. Um, a, a lot of it is around importation risk um, so so when we're all uh, so as a as a country when we're all comfortable th that we are no longer um, at risk of significant covid circulation um, uh, we'll, we'll obviously in, be in a much better place to reconsider those as a um, as premier mentioned uh, the um, it, it's also a matter of being in uh, in coordination with other other jurisdictions but it, it really is a matter of what what is the risk uh, what is the risk as we look to a second wave? Uh, what, what are the tools that we need to manage that risk? Thank you. The next question is about long-term care homes. CBC News reported that over 70% of COVID-related deaths were from long-term care facilities, and as of April, 90% of deaths were of people over 60. Based on these hard facts, why isn't this now the focus here in Yukon rather than continuing to target everyone? Th those, are, those are very hard facts. Uh, and we did take some very, very early actions to protect residents living in, in our, in our long-term care homes. Uh, I, I want to reassure Yukon families uh, that, uh, that Yukon facilities uh, where your loved ones are, they're very well uh, run uh, and, and they're being very well cared for and they're safe. Uh, we, we have five long-term care facilities uh, in Yukon, all of which are government-run. Uh, they're not for profit. Um, we, we are very fortunate that nearly all of our long-term care uh, homes have single rooms. Uh, this is a significant advantage that we have over other jurisdictions uh, should we uh, need to contain an outbreak. Um, and as always, uh, the Continuing Care Division continues to work very closely uh, in partnership with uh, Yukon Communicable Disease uh, Centre and the Chief Medical Officer of Health's Office on infection controls and practices and, and in, in the pursuit of managing uh, a potential outbreak. Um, again, this is extremely important uh, the, the, that we took early actions uh, to make sure that we protect our residents that are living in long-term care uh, because they are mo some of our most vulnerable citizens. Um, this includes restrictions of visits um, to only essential visitors uh, in, in all of our long care uh, homes. Uh, the essential visitors are screened before every visit. Uh, staff are working uh, to keep residents uh, active and engaged. Uh, they are doing amazing work. Uh, we are so lucky to have the level of professionalism that we do have in our long-term care facilities. Uh, we, uh, we are providing a variety of, of uh, recreational activities and programming uh, and facilitating virtual visits, uh, window visits, uh, you know, these things to support the families and to support the residents. Um, the, employee, the employees managing these facilities, again, they are very committed to, to the well-being of, of our residents. Um, the staff are required to stay home if they're feeling sick, uh, and, uh, and staff moving between facilities is very, very limited. Um, extra training is also being provided to staff uh, on, correction, uh, on correct use of, uh, of PPEs, personal protection equipment following our, uh, our existing policies and our procedures there as well. So we've established measured controls to safeguard uh, and to monitor the use of those protection equipments, those PPEs, uh, just to make sure that we have enough available uh, to continue to manage the current situation and to prepare for, for uh, whatever may come in the future. Yes, I have a few things to add uh, on that. One is um, that we were in a very fortunate position um, in the first place to have publicly owned and operated long-term care homes that were um, also um, single-room facilities. Um, so already in, 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 a, in a good position, already with um, well-rehearsed outbreak of protocols for respiratory illness. Um, and... Uh, um, and clearly, uh, we did, as we learned more about COVID, recognize the uh, disproportionate burden uh, th that has been taken um, on the elderly, particularly long-term care residents by, by COVID. 
So very important as we proceed through the opening phases that we reinforce the protections to our long-term care. Um, so even above what our baseline was, we've, um, as the Premier mentioned, been doing a lot of work to, um, to put in the extra, pr extra protections necessary. But, uh, of course, long-term care is not the only source of um, severe illness um, or, um, or, or fatalities that we've seen um, globally. Uh, so, um, so, so, of course, we have to address the, um, the, the risk to other vulnerable sectors of the population that are not in long-term care. So um, um, that includes, um, you know, elderly people who are living individually or in other types of settings and uh, other people with underlying medical conditions, um, and wh whatever their age, especially adults. Um, but, uh, if you know, if you have enough circulation of COVID, you will see complications all over the place. And even though those complications are disproportionately the, the, the more, more frequent the higher you go, um, they uh, that we we do see complications in younger in younger people as well. Um, you uh, will also have heard about, for instance, the uh, um, inflammatory syndrome in children that's associated with COVID as well as with other um, with other um, viral illnesses, uh, Kawasaki-like uh, syndrome. So you know it's it's not to. Um, uh, underestimate the the effect that COVID can have on on a population as well. So again, we need we need a proportionate response to proportionate uh, risk, um, and uh, we can't be oblivious to the risk that's outside of long term care. Um, uh, but we still need to strike that right balance, uh, which is why we are proceeding through these reopening phases. Thank you. The next question comes from a grade seven student. <clears throat> if I attend a summer camp, can I be within two meters of my friend, also my cousin, who's part of my family bubble? And is there any chance that over the summer, I can have overnight camping trips with our summer camp? These are really important questions. So, and I don't have all the answers to those questions yet, but we are working on answers to that. I, um, I would be quite comfortable with um, a bubble arrangement, a family bubble, um, a friend, cousin that is already part of the family bubble, whether that's within the household or one of the, the two household bubbles. Um, it would be like a brother and sister attending a camp, um, for example, and uh, they would be able to form their, their individual, um, to, to keep on to their um, individual um, b bubble or their, their, their combined bubble if that were compatible with the rest of the planning for the for the camps you know which is going to be very individualized according to how the camp is being set up so so in principle that that could occur but it really might depend on some other factors that are not primarily uh, health or public health uh, health reasons so definitely something to uh, to uh, get specific advice on um, we, what we are doing is we're reviewing a number of uh, a number of plans for, for camps and then providing commentary so that camps can proceed safely as possible as far as overnight camping trips uh, we have not uh, reserved a judgment on that uh, we're still reserving judgments I should say on, on whether at what stage we can permit um, o or endorse overnight um, overnight camps and again it might it, it might depend on uh, on uh, on exactly when the number of people who's involved where it's going um, but we're being very careful about that um, at the moment and have not uh, at, at the moment uh, put ourselves in a position to endorse um, overnight camping a little bit of a higher risk um, and so we're looking at that as a um, a, a later phase um, activity but m more on that as we uh, as we get towards finalizing our um, sports and REC um, guidelines. Have a no <clears throat> Excuse me. We did have a number of questions uh, around sports activities that may take place this summer. Uh, a lot of them were uh, specific inquiries about individual sports. Can you tell us what's going to happen with sport and recreation activities over the summer? Yeah, so we do have um, um, 
I believe we're going to be posting our sport and rec activities um, guideline uh, very shortly, if not today. Um, and uh, we have already um, reviewed a number of plans for particular sports and rec activities through our risk assessment decision or our RAD team. We're re reviewing a number of these as quickly as we can based on plans that have been um, submitted and some very uh, some very interesting plans. So lots is already going ahead. Head, where we're in, um, what we're really doing in terms of sports and recreation activities is um, looking for ways to proceed with activities or sports that do not involve um, a close contact. And we've had uh, many interesting and innovative um, examples submitted to us of how people are going ahead with, you know, it might be drills, it might be uh, sports like ex exercises, it might be uh, you know, more more limited cohorts of people at a time. But I think the best thing is look at, if you're planning an activity, would like to submit an idea, look at the guidelines first, make sure that it's compliant with all of the safe measures that we're recommending, and uh, give us your plan. And we really do our best to, to support or suggest ways to, to change things so that the activity can go ahead. Thank you. Uh, the next question has to do with masks, and it's uh, sort of a two-parter. Should masks be worn by members of the public, and do masks need to be worn by personal service workers and their clients? Yeah, so this, this is definitely a common, uh, a common question. And often, uh, obviously, it's one that's much, much in the news, and is also one that has gone through various iterations of recommendations at, at federal level. And that's been based on both evolving epidemiology and evolving evidence, and just increasing understanding of where masks may play a role. So these are these are um, yeah non-medical masks. Um, uh, so this is so really the the the. the the best evidence for use of a non-medical mask is kind of like covering your sleeve, a similar thing to covering your sleeve when you cough or sneeze. It really is another measure to prevent, uh, to help to prevent transmission of something that you are carrying, uh, like maybe you have an early respiratory infection, you're incubating COVID, for example. And it prevents you from sneezing into a room and creating droplets um, or, or coughing. It's very important that uh, the this the, a mask not be interpreted as a replacement for physical distancing. Uh, so it's not part of our safe six for a good reason. It's like an extra tool, and it's really for those for those situations where physical spacing is not possible. That is um, a rare circumstance, fortunately, in our jurisdiction, and that's why I'm not uh, actively recommending masks. Um, based on our epidemiology the, the, uh, and, and the lack of COVID circulating in our, in our community, um, it, there's, there's really little reason to justify uh, use of a, a medical, a non-medical mask in public. Um, the uh, so so w when you think of more densely urban areas where it may be hard to maintain physical sp uh, spacing and COVID is circulating, I think it's uh, th there is reasonable evidence to justify use of non-medical masks in those circumstances. Even in those circumstances, the primary deterrent to, for transmission, though, is the physical distancing. Uh, personal care services as an extra precaution because, uh, and that's what I mentioned, I think, at the last media update, it, it's, it's pretty hard to do many of the personal care services without being in very close contact. At the same time, this is a non-medical interaction, so it's, it's in a different sphere of, of regulation and, and guidance from um, a medical um, interaction. Um, and, and therefore, uh, as an extra precaution, where that distance, where that two meter distance can no longer be maintained, so you're coming around to the front as part of a haircut or uh, doing nails or something, then we then we ask uh, clients and uh, uh, and the provider um, to uh, to wear a non medical mask uh, just as an extra. Um, Precaution and really to protect both uh, both the uh, person providing the service and uh, and the client. 
And our last question today, um, are businesses expected or required to enforce physical distancing measures in their establishments? For example, should non-complying customers be asked to leave? Good question. Uh, it, it comes back down to that philosophy that we've been speaking about uh, throughout this whole uh, experience, uh, and that is that physical distancing, extremely important, uh, part of keeping yourself and others safe, as, uh, as Dr. Hanley just went through. Um, but it's one of those responsibilities that falls on each and every one of us as individuals. So the onus there being on the individuals to keep themselves safe by keeping them distant. Uh, I, I got to say the businesses have been uh, have been doing a wonderful job. They all approach uh, their operational plans uh, in in uh, in very uh, creative ways, interesting ways, uh, and I commend them uh, for going above and beyond uh, to keep Yukoners safe. We see uh, signage, we're seeing hand sanitizers, uh, you know, extra cleaning, uh, and even water washing in between uh, before you get into the store, uh, throughout the, the store visits. Uh, I'm extremely impressed with uh, the efforts that the business community has made uh, to, like I say, go above and beyond the recommendations. So, uh, you know, give them the support they deserve by all those extra me measures. When you're visiting people's stores, um, don't lose sight of the fact that the responsibility is on you as an individual to keep others safe and to keep yourself safe by, by practicing safe sex and by practicing the, the social distancing measures when you're out shopping in our communities. Yeah, I have to say I, I agree, and I, and I agree with um, the um, amount of work that have been done by businesses and, and establishments has been just extraordinary, and that um, that work is what's going to keep us out of trouble uh, when when we get further introductions of COVID. Um, into into the community, so that's what prevents a case from becoming an outbreak, and it and it is so important. Um, I I think um, again I I tend to lean more heavily on the um, education and information side. Um, it really set the standard um, and, and and just keep um, keep reiterating. Um, enforcement uh, plays a role, but I think as we go forward, um, likely uh, will. Um, we, we need to see it playing less and less of a role as this becomes more and more inculcated in us um, as our way of life for the time being. Um, and I think um, in terms of should non-compliant customers be asked to leave, uh, for me it really depends on what what is the level of uncooperation that is occurring. Is this a matter of a gentle reminder or is it a matter of a, you know, a, 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 someone that might be posing a risk to uh, to others and therefore other, other policies will, will kick in? So I do you think it reminds me of a conversation I had with Dr. Elliot just yesterday, and and we were talking about maybe the need to get better at uh, short of enforcement, but just being better at reminding each other uh, of when uh, when when we need to just you know back off a little bit, or or just you know uh, let it be acceptable to remind others of the need to uh, to safely distance. Um, and I'm I'm often a culprit myself and need that need that reminder that you know. Okay, just respect that safe safe distance, and because uh, we, you know, these are new habits. We all need to uh, to be uh, reminded of uh, of the need to do this. Thank you very much, Premier Silver. Thank you very much, Dr. Hanley. I would also like to acknowledge our ASL interpreter, Mary Thiessen. Oh. <laughs> we introduce everyone else, but we often forget to introduce Mary, so thank you very much. Um, I'd like to thank everyone for joining us today. I'm now going to hand it over to Cam Heek from the Executive Council Office, who will try and facilitate uh, questions from the reporters. Our next media, sorry, our next COVID-19 update will be Tuesday, June 2nd. Thank you. So I want to thank our media who have been on the teleconference line. Um, thank you for your patience. We, we have experienced some technical issues with, with our line today. Um, and we're going to try and make this work. If, however, we're getting um, uh, too much sound feedback and it's just not working, then what I'll ask media to do is just stay on the line. We will end the, uh, the live portion of this briefing and we'll continue with questions and answers with media after the live portion. But first, we'll attempt to do this live. So I do have uh, the list of, of media who have joined us today and we'll try and do this as per usual and we're going to start with Gord Yukon News. Gord have you got a question?
Okay. Uh, okay. It, and, and did you want to try that again? My apologies, I still had mute on. Ah. Oh, well, there we've got you, Gord. Okay, great. Please go ahead. Hello. Yeah. Go ahead. Okay, well, we're still trying to, to make this work. One more time. Pam, can you hear me? Yes. So, I think you yes, we, we can hear you now. Thank you. Please go ahead. Sorry about that. When will uh, government employees be returning to their offices? Uh, thanks for the question, Gord. Uh, so, you know, since the beginning of this, uh, UConn employers have been uh, at work, and uh, and they've been extremely flexible. Uh, we, we're very thankful for that. Uh, right now, what we see is about uh, half of our, our workers uh, are working remotely, uh, mostly from home. Uh, and again, we are uh, we're continuing to to uh, to see uh, a, a whole bunch of different uh, ver variables when when it comes to how folks are. Are, uh, are being flexible in, the, in their working hours. But uh, at, at the time, we're seeing an increase of folks coming back into the offices. But right now, uh, it's about 50% that are working from home. And uh, we, uh, again, if people feel more comfortable working uh, remotely, well, they uh, I have to give a shout out to Highways and Public Works for all the work they did for the virtual clients to allow for, for that, uh, for that uh, uh, technology to be in place in, in, in their laptops. Uh, and uh, again, we are seeing... Uh, folks uh, on a weekly basis doing more work from the offices here and less from home, but they do have the av availability and end ability to, uh, to do both. Gord, have you got a follow-up question? I do not. Thank you. Thanks, Gord. We'll now move to John CKRW. Go ahead, John. John uh, left the line. Uh, oh, here. okay. Thank you. Uh, I've also got John Yukon News. Is John still with us? Hi, yes, I'm, I'm still here. Please um, go ahead. Thanks for, for uh, the extra time and, and everything. Um, my question is just uh, more of a clarification, I suppose. It's about the, the new campground regs. The, the thing that stands out to me is the bubble rule and the uh, um, Is that something that can be enforced, or is that, is that a recommendation uh, from the CMO? I think the question is on um, social distancing in in campsites. Yeah. I, so I th I think if if I heard the question correctly, at least as interpreted by the premier, it's uh, whether the household. I think the extended bubble could apply to a campsite um, setting. And I think if you're in the bubble, you're you're in the bubble. So um, I, I think that would be a way to. Uh, to uh, um, as long as it stayed within that bubble, um, and of course, and stayed within all the other regulations, um, then um, I, I think that would be acceptable. Is that answering the question? My, um, not really. My question was: if that if is that a recommendation, or is that something that will be enforced? I.e., will people be checking where people live, and if there's more than two households represented? <sighs> Uh, oh, uh, okay. Well, so it's a kind of a mix of two issues, I think. Uh, so, um, so the two household bubble is not an, an order. It's not. Um, it's not an enforceable. Uh, it's not something that's going to be enforceable. Um, so it's a it's a recommendation um, and a way to yeah a way to relieve some of the stress of of being confined is to elect that bubble. So it's a kind of a trust. You know, it's a request and uh, and and a request for trust at the same time so what you know so i guess the the implication is how would that translate into monitoring campsites and i guess it would depend on a, on a conversation and uh you know whether there um there could be a, a reasonable explanation for number of people at a campsite thank you have you got a follow-up question john <laughs> Okay. Okay. I did hear a no in there somewhere, so uh, thank you for that. Uh, we, next, we have uh, Chris with CBC. Please go ahead, Chris. Yeah, uh, thank you. Uh, I, I, uh, so, 
Uh, I, I guess I'm, I'm wondering about um, whether, I, I guess there are still going to be border controls uh, in July, right? Like uh, folks from places besides BC will still be turned away at the border. Um, and I guess the other part of this question is folks from BC, once they're in the territory, like they'll be able to go to campgrounds. They could, they basically have uh, the same freedom of movement as, as anyone else. Is that correct? Uh, yes, Chris, um, and thanks for this question. This was a uh, part of a, of, a, of a big conversation today uh, with the municipalities, uh, with the mayors and councils, with the chief and councils as well. Uh, it's extremely important uh, that at this point, as we're now considering moving into that second phase, we have to double down on, on, on a collective effort on border controls and making sure that uh, we take a look at what's been working, what, what we need to fix, what we need to do better. Uh, as we as we transition into a new phase, but but you know to answer your question, uh, yes, like there's there still will be people at borders. Um, if you're coming in with a BC license plate, you still have to sign a declaration, um, just like you would if you were a Yukoner returning in the past. Uh, and and really, we have to uh, we're, we're we're working with the communities to make sure that uh, we can increase our our communicational abilities between the communities, between governments, uh, when it comes to us, uh, you know, reestablishing and 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 bolstering our efforts at the border. Uh, yeah, and I will just add. Uh, I agree. And, and of course, this is, you know, one of the reasons we're saying this a month ahead is um, because we were asked to um, provide, you know, some insight into, uh, I, I guess, give adequate warning that this is, this is, the, this is the idea. Um, it's actually a month away, um, which seems very unusual in these times. Um, but 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 so clearly there are a lot of details to be worked out on, on to how that will operationalize. But but the, the that 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 is the principle. As the premier said, those are the principles that we're working with. The. Um, there, there will be where I can see some restrictions would be on, and I think I mentioned that, but but on high risk, um, perhaps high risk settings, and that would be, for instance, um, a visitation to long term care. Um, I still might uh, ask. Uh, people uh, not to visit um, long-term care, even if they're from BC, uh, uh, but place them into that kind of bucket of uh, as if they were coming from s somewhere else in, in Canada and uh, adhere to those rules. Okay, have you got a follow-up question? I do, thanks. Um, so, uh, I suspect the Premier could predict that I'm going to ask him about this. Um, given that the, the Northwest Territories Legislature has resumed, um, Alberta's has continued sitting throughout uh, most of, of, this, uh, of this pandemic, um, and given that the, the government is now confident enough in easing restrictions on travel and business, uh, why not uh, reopen the legislature as the opposition parties have repeatedly asked you to? Uh, thanks, Chris. Uh, yeah, so. Again, in Northwest Territories, the reason why they are uh, in the Legislative Assembly is to do what we've already accomplished, and that is to pass the budget. Uh, you know, and again, we've offered to meet to discuss the 2020-2021 budget uh, in response to uh, the opposition's requests. Uh, they refused. Uh, we have offered uh, meetings with the Minister of Justice and Community Services uh, to discuss ministerial orders uh, passed in response to COVID. They, they have not responded to that either. Um, and to keep them informed about uh, responses to COVID uh, in, in Yukon, uh, opposition parties uh, receive the, uh, the government of Yukon's uh, emergency measures uh, organization, uh, COVID-19 daily updates. Um, they also receive weekly briefings uh, from the chief medical officer of health. In addition, they have been provided briefings on various uh, COVID-19 uh, response programs, including uh, the paid sick leave support, uh, the Yukon Business uh, Relief Program, uh, and also the COVID-19 uh, Rent Assistance uh, Program. Uh, so uh, again, you know, we've offered those those uh, those the provisions. Uh, they've refused or didn't respond. Uh, in the fall, uh, we've committed as well uh, to do what we do with all emergency spending that happens, uh, which is to do the supplementary budget and, and have complete open and transparent uh, conversations about all of the expenses uh, that we've accumulated. All of those expenses are publicly available online and through our, they're, they're even listed in our, in our recovery plan. 
and, uh, and, and we, we continue to remain focused right now on the health and the safety of Yukoners uh, and, uh, and supporting them through, uh, through these challenging times. Okay, we did have a question that was emailed in from John Kennedy because unfortunately he did have to step off the line. Okay, sure. Um, and it was actually a similar question. It was both for yourself, Premier, uh, but since you've, I mean, you can answer again, but you've answered that one. Uh, it was also asked for Dr. Hanley. So the specific uh, question in John's email is, do you think the current COVID-19 situation in Yukon is suitable enough for legi legislative proceedings? You know, my answer is that that's for, that's for the Premier and the government to decide. Thank you. Next, we'll go to Gabrielle with Whitehorse Star. Gabrielle? Hi, kind of a follow-up to Chris's question. Does the open border mean that tourism operators in the Yukon should now market to travelers in D.C.? Are we hoping that there will be some tourism there that can help that understand. industry out? Yeah. Uh, Sure. So, uh, yes. In, in, in short, uh, you know, this is uh, this is welcome news uh, in in the fact that uh, that we have done everything uh, to the best of our ability through following science. I, I know I say it a lot, but it's just so important uh, that, uh, you know, we're, we're so lucky to live in Yukon. We're so lucky to live in Canada, where where every region is following the chief uh, medical officers of health in those regions' advice. Uh, we are in a situation right now where we can move forward and, and we can, uh, we can uh, you know, by working out these plans, we can be ready by July 1st. Uh, uh, Premier Horgan is excited as well uh, to welcome Yukoners into uh, into his ter his province and and also welcome to see uh, some folks uh, coming into ours as well. Now it, it's it's definitely something we want to work on with the tourism associations and with the Department of Tourism and Culture. I know Jeannie Dendy's the minister responsible, and also Ranch Pillay, the minister of Economic Development, has been in close contact with all of the stakeholders, the shareholders in in those businesses, uh, and so cautiously optimistic. But we definitely are in a situation where we can do that. Uh, again, uh, the the thing that keeps me up at night is, uh, you know, not wanting to move backwards. And uh, the best thing we can do to support our tourism industry, the best thing we can do to support businesses that have been uh, struggling um, and, and uh, you know, in the most stressful times probably of their business careers, we need to be diligent with our social distancing. We need to be diligent as individuals to make sure that we're still keeping up with the safe six. Uh, and if we do that, uh, along with the excellent guidance that we've gotten uh, from both uh, uh, Dr. Henry in British Columbia and Dr. Hanley and his team here in, in Yukon, uh, we, we can have uh, a, 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 a bit of a, an industry now here with British Columbia and Yukon uh, as of July 1st. Gabrielle, have you got a follow-up question? Yeah, yeah, we, we can, hear, can you. hear you. Please I'm go ahead. A little fuzzy again. Can yeah. you hear me? Yes. We can. Okay. Um, why were the cell phones issued by the Yukon government and the Yukon status of Women Council and Northwest Pell, those 325 phones to vulnerable women, why were those cancelled? Yeah, so thanks for the question. Uh, I'm just hearing about this myself. Uh, so our government knew that uh, the effects of the pandemic uh, could people could put people into uh, difficult situations, uh, and so that's why we did partner with the Status of, uh, of Women Council uh, and also Northwest Territory. Northwest Northwest Tel uh, to provide uh, those phones with a limited amount of data uh, to those who did need them. At this time, the, the data has been used up. Uh, I understand that the women who have received those phones uh, will be keeping those phones and will be able to transfer the phones, uh, the telephone numbers uh, to the to their names by contacting Bell. Uh, and that's uh, that's all the information I have for you at this time. Thank you, Gabrielle. Now we have Julien Aurore Boreal. Julien, avez-vous une question? Okay, I think Julien may have left the call actually. Okay. So I, I don't, is there anyone else that I've missed from media that's still on the line? Okay. I think we've got everyone. Uh, thank you, everyone, and thank you so much again to our journalists on the line for your patience today. Oh, Premier. 
I would also like to thank Mary. This is probably the most uh, time that we spent uh, with her in interpreting. Uh, so thank you very much, Mary, for all your support. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. And our next update, as mentioned by Pat, will be June 2nd. Thank you.